We talk a lot about sleep and sleep is extremely important, but there are other modes of and brain states that can allow you to recover. One of the ones that I'm a huge proponent of and that my lab has been studying and other labs are studying is what many people call yoga nidra. Where you, I've done no yoga nidra a lot. It's a wonderful practice, yeah. you know, just lying down and focusing enough of your attention so that you don't fall asleep and enough of your attention on and moving it around so that you're not really concentrating on any one thing. I fall asleep every time. I do too. <laughs> okay. uh, I do too. But what we know, so I fundamentally disagree with respectfully though, with the idea that we can't recover sleep that we've lost. Because what are we really talking about there? For me, it's the ability to perform these duration path outcome analyses. So in my lab, we have people do a cognitive task and then we place them into these very deep states of relaxation through things that are kind of like yoga nidra. Mm -hmm. And people can find yoga nidra scripts out there. They're everywhere on YouTube, elsewhere. Or we have them do a hypnosis script. Hypnosis is very similar. Deep relaxation, wandering sort of attention, fairly narrow context, but it brings the brain into these unique states where you're neither asleep nor awake. And for people that have trouble falling asleep or trouble relaxing themselves, these kinds of practices are extremely useful because they're really teaching you how to turn off those modes of focus. So, you know, we, we live in a stressed society. Some people are stressed because they're overwhelmed, but other people are stressed because they just don't know how to turn off their brain and fall asleep. And so if you want to learn how to turn off your brain and fall asleep, these practices are immensely useful. How do you practice hypnosis by yourself though? So there's some scripts. I would recommend people go to one of the scripts on YouTube or um, there's some good ones. I've never met him. I don't have any relationship to him, but Michael Seeley, S-E-A-L-E-Y, uh -huh. uh, Australian guy, um, has some really good hypnosis scripts. And uh, they're just audio programs? Yeah, you just listen to them. And, these, uh, and he's not going to make you walk off a cliff or anything. No. So stage okay. hypnosis is very different. I, uh -huh. So I have a very close collaboration with a guy named David Spiegel, who's in our psychiatry department uh -huh. at Stanford. We're now looking at how daily breathing um, exercises can impact people's sleep and levels of stress. He's done a lot of work on addiction and trauma and pain management through hypnosis. And most all of hypnosis that's clinical involves bringing one's state into one of deeper relaxation, not full sleep, and then thinking about some behavioral change that one wants to make. These are ancient practices really. And I think that they were developed by people that understood that rewiring of the brain requires focus and deep rest. What's interesting about hypnosis is it brings those two things together at the same moment. So normally you'll work really hard on something, work really hard, then you'll sleep and that's when the plasticity occurs. But hypnosis likely accelerates that whole process by having people enter a state of deep relaxation and focus at the same time mm. and allows those circuits to reshape themselves. And there's some published data uh, from David's lab to support that. That's fascinating. So I think these practices are really useful. And I think that <laughs> if you want to get better at performing, everyone now knows, thanks to Matt Walker's book and others, like sleep more, sleep better. But what if you have trouble sleeping? Well, or falling asleep. Well, we want to define what that is. Some people have a hard time turning off their thoughts. It's really hard. Remember, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. What you can do is to learn to control that perceptual window and distribute it so that your sense of time starts to kind of drift off and you end up in sleep more easily. And it's a practice that most people find if they do it for 10 minutes a day or so, they start sleeping much better within within a week or, or more, you know, and sometimes more. They Sometimes people need some other help, like not drinking caffeine yeah. late in the day, et cetera. But that brain state of no duration path and outcome analysis is gonna be the most restorative and you can get it in wakefulness too. So taking a walk where you're just letting your mind go is very powerful. And the other thing that's powerful is optic flow. So self-generated optic flow by walking, running, or cycling shifts the brain into a state of relaxation that's not seen when you're stationary. This is well des well described in the neuroscience literature. For some reason, it's not well described in the wellness literature, um, but it's a real thing. When you move through space, you're active. You're, there's a natural calming of the brain circuits mm -hmm. involved in threat and threat detection. This is the basis for EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. The lateralized eye movements they have people do in the clinic, that kind of goofy looking thing while they right, recount trauma. I've heard you trauma. talk about that to overcome fear and trauma. That right? lowers stress. And the, the, the rationale is that by coupling a low stress state 
to the recall of the trauma, it's going to allow people to reshape their relationship to the trauma, to tolerate the, the discomfort. And it, EMDR, my clinical colleagues tell me, works best for fairly well-defined traumas. It's not going to be like my childhood mm. or you know a whole series of events, but for single event traumas or a, a trauma that's repeated but of the same sort, it seems to work best. It's not going to work best to completely reshape all relationships to all traumas, but it does seem to be powerful for a certain set so of people. So basically an example would be if you got into a car accident and then you're afraid to get in a car or something like that, right? So yeah. you take this person and and you submit them to this therapy where they move their eyes back and forth laterally, which seems absurd. Seems goofy. <laughs> right? right. So this is supposed to help them get over their, their fear or their blockage? Yeah. So, okay. So my lab studies vision and we study stress and states of mind. And people used to talk to me about EMDR and ask me about EMDR. And I was like, this is crazy. This it is sounds like a music genre. This is absurd, right? Or a drug. It makes no sense. Why would moving the eyes from side to side have any impact on states of mind? That's ridiculous. But then what happened was in 2018, 2019, and 2020, five quality manuscripts came out in very good journals from groups that were studying eye movements, not studying stress or trauma, that found that these lateralized eye movements, not up and down, but lateralized eye movements, quiet the activity of the amygdala, the limbic structure in the brain that's primarily responsible for threat detection and stress. And I was like, oh my goodness, this thing might actually be real. Then I started to dig into the backstory of this. And there was a woman named Francine Shapiro who came up with this idea, actually walking behind Stanford in the Stanford Hills. She was a therapist and she figured she had this idea based on the fact that she didn't feel as upset about certain things when she was walking, that this might be useful. And she was smart enough to know that these lateralized eye movements are what reflexively occur anytime we're in optic flow. We don't realize it because they're subconsciously generated and they're very subtle, but she realized she couldn't really take people walking on their therapy sessions. I suppose she could, but it's not really practical, it's raining, et cetera. So what she decided to do was to bring the eye movement component to the clinic and have them move their eyes from side to side while they would recount these traumas. And people experienced tremendous benefit. And in fact, now there's a lot of evidence to show that these lateralized eye movements really do quiet the stress of the nervous system and allow people to continue to move forward. This is probably all anchored, I go back to that story of that deer, that needs something. And as it's feeling that agitation and gets up and starts moving, the movement feeds back onto the brain to quiet that stress and anxiety so it can be observant of its environment. And that panoramic mode is what we are in when we are in a position to be very situationally aware. When we're stressed, we're gonna have you know, soda straw view Focused. of the world. 